What's up guys, Alexander here with Date Psychology. Today, talking about bad boys, nice guys. We're gonna talk about good personality a little bit, but we're gonna focus mostly on bad boys. Why are bad boys attractive? What does the research show? And what does that mean to be a bad boy? Let's go ahead and go forward here. So three topics, but this video is getting pretty long. I'm going to cover more research in this than just one or two papers. So bad boys, nice guys, and you know, good personality, right? Topics that all kind of go together, which is why I included them here. But this does raise a question, doesn't it? Why are these things attractive or unattractive? What does it mean to have a good personality, right? All of that. People have different ideas. Let's kind of go over some of those. So the nice guy, right? We have one definition. When people say this, they mean a man who is genuinely nice, some, someone who's nice, simply, authentically nice. We have a man who mimics the so-called supreme gentleman, right? Basically someone who is playing a character of a sort of 19... 20s, 30s, 40s era gentlemen following perhaps archaic courting behaviors, right? Maybe they're trying a little too hard in that sense. We have another, the nice guy that you'll kind of see in the nice guys subreddit, right? Our nice guys, which is basically a facade of niceness. Men who act very nice initially, but as soon as they face rejection, you see that mask slip. You can see the last video on psychopaths, similar thing, right? So people who put up a mask of niceness, a facade of niceness in that sense. It's often a kind of Machiavellian pretending to be nice because they think that is what is going to get them sexual access or romantic access, right? And we have niceness associated again with a man who's just weak or timid, right? A sort of milk toast, as they used to say. So these different ideas of niceness, you know, it means different things, the nice guy. Some of these are not attractive to women. Being, you know, genuinely nice, actually like nice, yeah, it's probably not gonna hurt you. But some of these other things, you know, they might not get you that far. And if you're setting out with the mentality like, how far is this gonna get me in dating? Well, you know, can I just be really nice and get the girl? And then you're kind of slipping into that mimicry of the supreme gentleman, right? That Machiavellian pretending, that facade of niceness. So as a dating strategy, like I'm just gonna try to be really nice. Yeah, maybe that's not exactly what you're looking for either. Let's go on to the next slide here. Bad boys, on the other hand, what is that? Again, different definitions. Some of these converge, but some of them are also very different. And when people say a bad boy, particularly when men say it, especially if they're a little bit upset about, you know, women don't want a nice guy, they only want a bad boy, they might mean something very different from what women say when they say they want or are attracted to a bad boy, right? So... On the one hand, you know, a bad boy can simply be an appearance. You know, leather jacket, motorcycle, they look macho. That's it. So the bad boy is a look. It's an aesthetic. You have a bad boy in a more literal sense, which is basically a psychopath, right? Someone with antisocial personality disorder, someone very high in antisocial personality traits, but subclinical, right? They don't have a diagnosed disorder like the dark triad, right? people who are very high in these traits. So it's antisocial behavior or antisocial personality. You see bad boys sometimes associated with crime, right? So if someone is, has been convicted of crimes, basically, you know, Jeremy Meeks, we've talked about him before, the hot felon, right? Uh, committed some crimes, so everyone says, ah, he's a bad boy, but he also has that bad boy look to him, doesn't he? He looks kind of like a handsome gang member, even if he has desisted from crime completely, but still, we're on point three here. So people associate a bad boy with literally being a rule breaker, criminal, a deviant in that sense. And then we also have a bad boy that's kind of a, a rogue, right? A lovable rogue, a, or a rake, that sort of a thing. So this is where you're gonna see the bad boy who is charming, sexually exciting, he's not boring, he's extroverted. Often in this case, you'll see these individuals have kind of a mixture of pro-social and deviant behavior, right? Kind of going into that with the next slide. Related to that, so this, you know, this much discussed good personality. Women don't like you because you have a bad personality. Women like a good personality. What does that mean? Well, people seem to 
think personality or this phrase, good personality, means different things depending on who you ask. And I think women and men talk over each other when they're talking about it. So on the one hand, you have, you know, good personality is someone who follows ethical or moral behavior. So an individual who's a criminal, who has committed crimes in the past, people would say, and I've seen this many times, he's not a good person, or excuse me, he doesn't have a good personality. Why? Well, we know he doesn't have a good personality because he's done something bad. Okay, so a good personality in this definition is simply someone who is very conventional. That's a rule follower, right? So also kind of related to the nice guy. And so you see an overlap between what people interpret as having a good personality and being a nice guy in the sense often of being someone who's kind of uh, straight-laced, who's afraid to break rules, who's probably more timid and that sort of a thing. On the other hand, when people say good personality, and I think this is what women mean more, and when I talk about good personality in the context of dating, attractiveness, that sort of thing, this tends to be what I mean. Uh, what is a good or bad personality in a dating context, right, is defined by what's attractive to the opposite sex, not what is necessarily ethical or moral behavior. So some of that behavior can be antisocial, some can be pro-social, and some can be just completely ambiguous, right? So what's a good personality? Uh, extroversion seems to be more attractive than introversion, right? So someone with a good personality, you might say, you know, being extroverted is having a good personality. Although being extroverted is not a moral good or bad, it's ambiguous, right? It falls into the ambiguous category. You're not a bad person for being an introvert. You're not a better person or whatever. Something like confidence as well, right? You're more confident or even something like risk taking. These are not things that make someone good or bad in an ethical or moral sense, but they may make personality combinations, expressions of personality through behavior that are more or less attractive. And when people say a good personality, that's often, you know, I should say when women say good personality in the context of what is attractive in a man, it's often some mixture of things like this, mostly traits that are ambiguous and pro-social, but sometimes some antisocial traits, right? For example, you know, women might want a man who's capable of fighting other men. Simple as, you know, good evolutionary explanations for that. So, you know, someone with a criminal record might seem more attractive because at least it signals, hey, this is someone who's capable of doing something, which is also very different from saying, this is someone who's going to do that to me, right? And we'll go into that a little bit later because again, personality, behavior, if someone is a bad boy or a nice guy, it's not just about how they express themselves towards a woman that they're interested in, but how they interact with the world around them. And there may be expressions toward the world outside of the relationship dyad, right? That are seen as attractive that would not be within the relationship, right? You get in a fight at a bar because someone insults you, whatever. Maybe, you know, maybe that could even be kind of hot. You get in a fight with your wife because she insults you and you hit her in the face. Yeah, that's not something that women like at all, even though the behavior is kind of similar, right? So it's context dependent behavior, personality, and all of that. Let's go on here to the next slide. We're going to look at this paper first. It's called Bad Boys, Bad Boys, Who's Got a Thing for You? Examining the Sexual Appeal of Bad Boy Archetype. And in the introduction of this paper, the discussion section, they mention two characters. I think this is from Happy Days or I don't know, an old TV show, but I remember watching this. And we have Fonzie and we have uh, this other guy. Some of you will <laughs> remember him, but I, I don't. And we have here a bad boy and a nice guy archetype. And these are two characters that throughout the show were depicted uh, in their relationships being very different because of that. Fonzie, of course, had a lot of success with women, right? He, he had no problem. He would snap his fingers and the women would come, I think almost literally in some of these, these episodes. The other guy, you know, the whole plot, the narrative was like, I'm always struggling to get a girl. How do I attract a girl? And so on. And so here you see something that is image because you didn't see a lot of antisocial behavior in these shows, but you see Fonzie, he wears a leather jacket. He's got that greaser look to him, right? He's got the shirt on underneath that and the image of the time of bad boy, he rode a motorcycle, uh, his face is a bit more dimorphic, a bit more masculine as well. So that's another thing you might see associated with a bad boy physically, right? Because we're looking here at kind of that first definition of the bad boy, the appearance, 
that there is an appearance physically that distinguishes someone who looks like a bad boy from a nice guy that's already, you know, preceding whatever their actual behavior is. But that doesn't mean that the behavior is not important. We're going to talk mostly about that. Let's go on to the next slide. As I mentioned that, uh, facial dimorphism in the case of the fawns, right? More masculine face. So a more dimorphic face in other words. This study, they did a couple of, well, they did an experiment using dating apps and they modified photos, right? You can edit these with an image editor to be more or less masculine. So the same male faces, edit them up a little bit. Some are more masculine or more dimorphic. Some are less masculine or less dimorphic. In this paper, they called these the high testosterone and low testosterone faces, but there's not much of an association between sir, in fact, it's pretty much zero, between serum testosterone and facial dimorphism, right? That's something in your genes that will be determined as well in prenatal development, right? In the womb of the woman, but, and testosterone can, yeah, certainly impact that in fetal development. But as far as like, can you tell if someone has higher or low testosterone from their face? Typically not, right? So, you know, the soy boy face thing, it's not real, but they call that that in this paper anyway, they didn't really explain or justify why. So I'm calling it facial dimorphism. I think it's more accurate. And then in the profile, they had two conditions. So you have a bad boy profile that says, you know, I drive this kind of bad boy car and I like to do extreme sports and all of that. And then you have the good, good boy car or the nice guy profile, excuse me. And it's like, I drive a, you know, Toyota and you know, I'm, I don't like to take big risks and all of that. So you have, you know, a two by two ANOVA. So you have, you know, face, masculine, feminine, bad boy, nice guy gives you four combinations, two by two. So let's go on. Here are some results kind of describing these. Uh, you have, you know, uh, well, yeah, going right into the results, okay? So the face that was high in masculinity, but not the bad boy profile was rated as the most desirable. Okay, this was across all of the conditions for short-term, long-term relationship, whatever. And high masculinity as well was also more desirable across both conditions. So more masculine faces were more desirable in this experiment. And the combination when high masculinity and the nice guy was the most attractive. So I wanted to start with this paper because we're going to see across all of these that there seems to be what is desirable to women is kind of a synthesis, a combination of traits of the bad boy and of the nice guy. In this case, we're seeing, okay, bad boy appearance in that sense, right? Or at least high masculinity. Uh, but the bad boy manipulation as far as behavior did not seem to have any effect at all. Let's go on. Here's another paper. It's called Tattooed Men, Healthy Bad Boys and Good Looking Competitors. I'm just going to share the results of these. So no relationship with attractiveness. You know, they took a bunch of different pictures of men in this one, actual men. They edited the photos to put tattoos in some, the others left them without tattoos, and that didn't change attractiveness at all. So, you know, we have an association with being tattooed and being a bad boy, but tattoos didn't have an effect. So there's another physical expression, right? Uh, aesthetic appearance type of expression of a bad boy that didn't show an effect here. but. Men with tattoos, they were seen as more masculine, they were seen as more dominant and more aggressive. And we know that these three things are also associated with attractiveness, with having more sexual partners, uh, that sort of a thing, with short-term relationships as well. So it's not the case, although we did not see attractiveness ratings go up, it's not the case that this would not necessarily impact uh, relationship outcomes because we know that behaviorally, Things like behavioral dominance actually seem to predict having more sexual partners over the lifetime than even uh, facial attractiveness does. So it's not necessarily the case that you know this is meaningless, but there was a larger effect for men, meaning that men rating these pictures saw them as more masculine, dominant, and aggressive than women, right? So these may be in particular cues that have more to do with male-male competition right? Intrasexual competition uh, for mates or for status could be either. And that's important because men that win competitions with other men uh, in a modern environment, as well as in an ancestral environment, 
tend to be seen as more attractive, okay? That's a part of the big mating picture is winning uh, male-male status competitions, physical competitions, and all of that. So, tattoos, effect of, on attractiveness, well, in this paper, no, but some other things to consider there. Let's go on. Here's another one. This was a, a paper, but I took this from a poster they had at a show. It's called An Analysis of Personality Type and Relationship Desirability Within Hookup Culture. Nice guys versus bad boys. So, the nice guy, you know, they had these conditions. This was, I believe, videos. And if I, I think so, I'd have to check, but it could have been videos or photos of, of an interaction. In any case, the nice guy manipulation here, more likely to get a second date. For hookups, no difference between the nice guy and the bad boy, okay? But what did predict a more, a stronger willingness to hook up? Uh, well, if women had a higher intention to have casual sex at the beginning, they were more willing to hook up with both nice guys and bad boys. So that's another picture of the puzzle, isn't it, right? And we know all about this, that women are not a monolith. You know, on average, women have a bit of an aversion to hookups and casual sex and a stronger orientation toward monogamy. But when you have women who are higher in sociosexuality, who have more of a willingness to hook up from the beginning, yeah, they're going to be more willing to hook up with other people. But it doesn't seem to be the case, at least in this study, that they were more willing to hook up with bad boys. No difference across these conditions. But, so we've seen some papers up to this point that found no difference. But that's not the case across a lot of research. We do see similar papers, manipulations, that do find a bad boy effect, specifically in the context of short-term relationships, probably more than not. And I don't know if any kind of meta-analysis has been done on this to know how large this effect is or how consistent it is across the research, but from what I have read, you know, okay, the bad boy attracting this thing is real. It has a relationship, again, to short-term relationships. Uh, you don't always see it in every paper. I've covered some recent ones that I pulled up that didn't, but I've read some that do as well. Let's go on now to the next paper. This is called Dating Preferences of University Women, an Analysis of the Nice Guy Stereotype. Now, this used a quantitative and qualitative analysis, so Quantitative research is usually what I share with you guys. You know, we're taking measurements, statistics, quantified, right? Numbers, quantities. Qualitative is looking at people's statements, their stories, their narratives, doing an analysis on that. It can be combined with some uh, quantitative methods, but I, you know, I, I share that less because it's usually smaller sample sizes. It seems to be less replicable. It's difficult to replicate, taking a bunch of people's stories and that sort of a thing. But nonetheless, uh, I think some of what is in this paper is kind of valuable to understand how women view the nice guy and the bad boy, nonetheless. Here's how they kind of operationalized it in the research, right? Meaning, how did they define a bad boy or a nice guy? What does it even mean? Because that's another thing you see across all of this research looking at bad boy stereotypes and all of that. It can be operationalized in ways that are very different. Some might say, okay, bad boy, it means the dark triad. Others might say, bad boy, it means this vignette that we created. And that's kind of what we're looking at here, is a description based on what the researchers thought was a nice guy or a bad boy. I'm going to read it to you now. So, three items were constructed to measure women's perceptions and preferences regarding nice guys. The first item measured women's own preferences for a dating partner. You meet two men. One, John, is nice, but somewhat shy. He has not had any sexual experience. The other, Mike, is attractive, a lot of fun, and sexual experience. So basically, we're looking at three things. Nice, shy no sexual experience, okay? And we're looking at attractive, fun, sexual experience, and John, yeah, no sexual experience. Mike, he's had 10 sexual partners. So they ask, who would you prefer in this? Let's go on now to the next slide. Look at the results, okay? Most of the women, 95%, were willing to date the man with one past sexual partner. Only 5% of the women in the study <laughs> were willing to date the man with 11 past sexual partners. So there's more recent research, I've written about it, and I've actually done some on this as well, looking at women's ideal preferences in number of past sexual partners. In a man, it's pretty low, you know, it's usually it peaks at around like three or four. So if you see this and you think, wow, only 5% of women would be willing to date a man with 11 past sexual partners, well, you know, this is a, a preference. It's something that women state. If a man has had 
11 past sexual partners, you know, in real life, you know that, you know, a lot of women are, are willing to date that man. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that's something that is ideal. And at the same time, we see that men with zero sexual partners, virgin men, uh, that's usually seen as kind of a red flag, right? That does result in a little bit lower desirability. But even a small number of sexual partners in men is kind of seen as, as ideal. Most people seem to want a potential partner who's kind of chaste. Why is that? Well, you know, from the evolutionary perspective, again, and maybe also the common sense perspective here, uh, you know, disease risk, right? Disgust sensitivity, uh, willingness com to commit in a relationship and invest resources, right? A very promiscuous man does not signal that. So lots of things like that. And in the real world, you know, if you find a man who's had a bunch of sexual partners and a man who's had one, there can be other variables that confound that, right? like, again, physical attractiveness. A man who can have sex with a lot of people, he might just look better, right? And so women may overlook that. But all things being equal, okay? Having fewer sexual partners for a man, at least uh, pretty much across the little bit of research that has looked at this, seems to be a better signal than having a lot. So, and, and you know, not, not that 11 is necessarily a huge amount either, but whatever. Let's go on to the next slide. Results from the same paper, okay? 54% of women picking between the two men, they picked the nice guy. 28% said, yeah, both were fine equally, and 18% picked the bad boy. So in this paper, you see a preference as well for the nice guy. This is from 1999. Maybe things have changed a little bit, but that's what we see here. Let's, let's continue forward. Uh, individual differences in women, because we mentioned this again. Women are not just a monolith, and... If women prefer a man who is more of a nice guy on this spectrum, right, nice, bad boy, or whatever, uh, that will depend a lot on the personality traits of the woman. Women with fewer past sexual partners themselves pick the nice guy. Correlation of 0.33, so a small to moderate correlation in psychology. Women for whose sex was less important, they were also less likely to pick uh, the man with more sexual partners. And women who preferred fewer partners to begin with, yeah, they were more likely to pick the man with fewer partners. So women higher in sociosexuality, basically, right? Women with more sexual history prefer men with more sexual history. Women with less sexual history tend to prefer men who have less sexual history. You know, kind of a rule across mate selection called assortative mating. People pick partners that are similar to them. Some of that is assortment from the environment because they're exposed to people like that. Some of that is preference, right? That people show an actual preference for people who are similar to them in that sense. Let's go on. We're going to look at the qualitative assessments in this that I mentioned at the beginning. So personality differences. What's nice and bad even mean? What, you know, are the style that nice guys and bad boys interact with women? How do they differ? And what kind of relationships do they seek, right? So this is how women see the differences between bad boys and nice guys, right? That they have personality differences, nice guys and bad boys. They interact with women differently, okay? And they seek different types of relationships with women. Now, depending on the woman, those things could be, you know, in the guy's favor or against it, right? Because if a woman is very oriented toward a committed relationship, signs of commitment, you know, are, might be good. If she's very oriented toward short-term sex, signs of commitment might not mean anything. Things like excitement might mean more. Let's go on. These are kind of clusters that emerged when women described this and they performed this qualitative analysis, okay? So one of the nice guy stereotypes was a nice guy's a loser, okay? Kind of like at the beginning when I was making the list, you know, a loser. And how do they describe this? He's weak, he's predictable, he's boring and inexperienced, and he's unattractive. So physically unattractive. So he's a milk toast, the nice guy. That's one way, okay? But the other, also kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, is a good guy, a man who's genuinely good, right? He has a good personality, high standards and morals, and he's polite. So politeness is also associated with the nice guy. So you have two things here that are very different. A loser is a nice guy, but also, you know, a genuinely nice guy. A good guy is also a nice guy. And it's important when discussing, like, do women like nice guys or not, that you're able to understand that this phrase, nice guy, means things that can be very, very different. Uh, particularly when women say, I want a nice guy, they might mean something very different from what you have in your mind uh, as a nice guy. 
Let's go on to the next slide. This is a quotation from one of the women. This is kind of interesting. You know, in these qualitative studies, they like to share these. So one of the participants said this. She said, nice guys are generally, uh, nice guys are generally not as attractive and have a great personality to compensate for this shortcoming. Unfortunately, looks, not personality, tend to get a woman in bed. So kind of a black pill here, right? That's a black pill belief. This is from 1999. So it's not, you know, a modern <laughs> realization that women like attractive men. This woman associated nice guys with having lower physical attractiveness, right? And they might be really nice. They might have a good personality and it might compensate, but that personality is not as important as looks, okay? So that's the difference for this one participant, how she saw it. That nice guys, less physically attractive, uh, you know, bad boys, more attractive. And that's it. And kind of, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, one of the things that I think doesn't actually come up in a lot of the good, you know, bad boy, nice guy discourse is that it is associated with an image, okay? That some people look like a bad boy. Some people look more masculine. They look more rugged. They look, you know, like, like they could beat the shit out of you. And other people don't, you know, they look like a pushover. And already you have just seeing at a distance, you know, the soy face versus, you know, the giga chad, that kind of a thing. Let's go on. More bad boy stereotypes here. We looked at the nice guys. So one of these, these are clusters again, is the rebel. So the rebel bad boy image here. He's mysterious. He's daring. He's arrogant and he's dangerous. Okay. So there's all of this. He's the rebel. But again, he's not necessarily antisocial, right? Notice in none of these like crime comes up, right? Not like he's going to hurt me or something. Macho, kind of like we mentioned before. So he's someone that's physically strong and confident. This is probably closely associated to appearance in that case. Now we have fun is another one, okay? So this is someone that's adventurous, spontaneous, and outgoing. So that's also associated with the bad boy, although those are not even traits maybe that you would think of, you know, if you were to list name traits that are bad. Probably a lot of these traits you would not uh, associate with badness, and yet these are things that women associate with the bad boy archetype, right? And sexy. So we're coming back down kind of to physical appearance, but also behaviorally, right? So he's charming, okay? He's charismatic. He's good looking physical appearance, and he's sexually experienced as well, right? So the idea that this is someone that can attract many women and has in the past, right? The bad boy has a lot of women around him. Let's go on next. Uh, the sexual successes of bad boys. This is kind of what they asked, okay? Why are they more successful? And this is kind of what the women said. So one, they're more aggressive and they're more willing to lie and manipulate to get sex. So here we see something that's probably kind of related to perceptions, accurate perceptions, stereotype accuracy of the dark triad, that we have men who are more aggressive, they're willing to push for sex, and they're also more willing to manipulate and lie, okay? Second one here, and this is probably related to risk aversion, and you know, I've done a little bit of uh, a little survey on this, looked at some associations with risk aversion, and specifically in the context of approaching women, so that's something that women have noticed as well, that the bad boy, he's more likely to ask women for a date. Simple as, okay? Again, in the past, he's more desired by other women. How do they form that perception? Because of his past sexual experiences. So, again, the bad boy is someone who's had past sexual experience and, you know, other women desire him. So, this is also related to what's called pre-selection, perhaps, right? Because usually research on pre-selection looks at someone that's in a relationship. And, you know, they've done studies where a man is wearing a wedding ring, he's not. And the man with the wedding ring is seen as more attractive. So even men in long-term relationship contexts seem to get a benefit from pre-selection. Having been selected by women, it's possible that, you know, having past sexual experience with women does that as well. But, you know, there's probably a confounder there as well in real life uh, as opposed to these experimental manipulations, which is that if a man has had, you know, a lot of girlfriends, he's had a lot of past sexual experience, there's reasons for that, you know. It's not that that's probably made him attractive. He was attractive before he got to that point based on all of his behavior and his physical appearance. And the last one, again, comes up consistently. Uh, he's more physically attractive. So, again, what is being a bad boy in part? It's simply being more physically attractive, okay? It's not just behavior and all of that. There is a look, a physical look associated with being a bad boy. Men who are more attractive are going to be seen more as a bad boy, you know, a stereotype. Probably one of those stereotypes uh, contrary 
to the halo effect. Because we know that physical attractiveness, for example, uh, is associated with perceptions of positive personality traits. This is called the halo effect. But we do see some sort of reverse halo effect, uh, sometimes called you know, the horns effect. Women who are more attractive are sometimes seen as less competent, for example, right? You have like a bimbo stereotype. Men who are more attractive and more attractive women as well, sometimes they're seen as less trustworthy as, uh, also. So that can also kind of contribute. So there are a few you know, downsides to it. Mostly, you know, physical attractiveness is associated with positive perceptions. Let's go on to the next slide here, okay? Another paper, this is called The Perceived Attractiveness and Traits of the Dark Triad. Narcissists are perceived as hot, Machiavellians and psychopaths not. So people talk about the dark triad a lot and there's even, you know, pickup courses online from, you know, like anonymous people writing from the basement that are saying, I'm gonna teach you how to be more dark triad. You're probably not gonna be more dark triad if you've ever seen like the items on a scale like this. You know, it's not just like, I'm going to be a little bit more of a bad boy. It's antisocial behavior. But when people say the dark triad is attractive, there's three faucets of the dark triad, right? Narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Okay. It's not necessarily the case that all of these explain an equal variance of why the dark triad is attractive. This paper here, let's go on to the next slide. And I'll give you the results, okay? Narcissism, basically, it did most of the heavy lifting here. Narcissism is what was attractive, the faucet that's attractive. Why are narcissists more attractive? Here's a selection from the paper. I'll read it for you. Why are narcissists more appealing? In Western, more individualistic countries, some narcissistic behaviors, charmingness, agency, leadership, boldness, may even be desired and not have a negative feel to them. Note that participants exactly read which items the bogus people strongly endorsed. Wanting to be admired, striving for prestige and status, and requesting special favors is something, people, something that many people want to some extent or the other, and people not find those desires and behaviors particularly repulsive. Someone endorsing such items might be judged as more neurotic, on the other hand. So, you have some of these traits associated with a narcissism facet that may not be seen when you write them up, you know, in a vignette or something like that, as antisocial, right? And that's kind of, you know, a feature of narcissism. It's a feature of uh, psychopathy as well, to some extent, that they mimic pro-social behaviors and sometimes can engage in that. Not in this paper, but there was another paper, again, that looked at the faucets and said, yeah, it's just narcissism. Why? Because people who are higher in narcissism might care more about their physical appearance. And there might even be an association with attractiveness once you control for grooming uh, and narcissism. So that could be it as well, that narcissism is simply, okay, people, yeah, they're paying much more attention to their appearance, so they're more attractive for that. Let's go on, another paper here, the social nature of attractiveness, how to shift attraction from the dominant traditional to alternative masculinities. This is a paper from Spain, and you know the goal of this paper was like, how do we get women to like men who are less macho, less uh, bad boys, and like the nice guys? Basically, uh, I'm not going to go in, into that. I don't think they really found a solution, and I'm not sure, you know, that do you want a solution? Is that even, <laughs> I mean, whatever. But I liked this section, and so I was going to read it because it, it just discusses some other research to sum up. So it says, as has been studied by Fletcher, Pug, Vert, and Rios, in the research with teenagers led by Professor Maria Padros, that boys and girls aged 14 to 17 said that the boys who have the greatest ability to turn on a girl are those with strong and imposing character and at the same time are those who look down on others. When the same participants talked about boys who are guided by non-violent models of masculinity, they frequently spoke of them as boring and not attractive. They said, among other things, that they can be overwhelming and tiresome. One said, there are boys that are so nice that they seem stupid. Okay, so here you have, you know, again, a dichotomy with nice guys and bad boys, where nice guys have, you know, some good traits, but they also have other traits, personality traits, that are, you know, bad personality, right? Even if they're not morally bad, they're boring, you know, they're not attractive, again, association with attractiveness here, but they're overwhelming, they're tiresome, right? And they're so nice that they seem stupid. So you have, you know, an association with nice guys being naive, kind of dumb, uh, boring and, you know, uh, a bore as well, right? Tiresome. And on the other hand, the, you know, 
the bad boy. What is he? Uh, he's strong and imposing, right? So he's masculine. He has behavioral dominance in that sense, but he's also kind of a bully or he's kind of arrogant, right? He looks down on others. And why might that be attractive? It could signal dominance over others. It could signal a willingness to confront others. It could also signal high status in that sense. So these are things, you know, that you have kind of an antisocial behavior, very mild one, you know, looking down on others, it's not a big deal. But that could be, you know, kind of related to that cluster because it does maybe perhaps signal uh, desirable traits in a way. Let's go on now to the next slide. This is from, I believe, someone's dissertation. And it's kind of called, you know, the gray literature in psychology, not a published paper, it's someone's dissertation. These people's PhD dissertations, usually they're better than like a lot of published research. So don't think like, oh, it's not peer reviewed, no one cares. But let's uh, look here. They created a cluster of traits for nice guys and bad boys. And they correlated this with age. They were saying, okay, do younger women or older women prefer more of the nice guy or the bad boy? But let's just go down the list first uh, because these traits were based on something like 20 something papers that they derived the items from. You know, they said these are traits associated with nice guys and bad boys across all of the research. So what's a nice guy, okay? He has the ability to be a good father, a good husband, a good long-term partner. He's high in agreeableness. He's high in expressiveness and openness. High in generosity, high in honesty. He's liked by friends and family. High intelligence, he's romantic. Sense of humor, sexual faithfulness, stability and warmth. So note, these are all positive traits associated with a nice guy. And the same is true for the bad boy, okay, in this list. It's only positive traits. So we're not looking at any of the negative stereotypes associated with nice guys and bad boys. For the bad boy, what do we see? He's adventurous, he's ambitious, assertive and athletic. He has brave and heroic qualities. Confrontational personality, he's energetic, he's exciting and interesting. He has money or earning potential. Uh, he's muscular, you know. Uh, passion between the two, okay? So he's more passionate or sexual. He's higher in physical attractiveness, okay? He has high self-confidence and a higher social status as well. So looking at these, which ones correlate with age? Which ones do younger women prefer? And which ones do older women prefer? So the ones that have two stars next to them, those are the ones that are negatively correlated with age, meaning that they're preferred by women who are uh, older in that sense, or I should say, excuse me, women who are younger in that sense. So being liked by family and friends, uh, being more adventurous, ambitious, basically what you see here, you know, athleticism, brave and heroic, confrontational, exciting and interesting, and also passion. And then ones that women who are older prefer, ability to be a good husband, having higher intelligence, stability, and warmth. Okay. So what do we see? Let's just go on to the next slide right off the bat we see that age was associated with eight out of the 15 bad boy traits and only four out of the 13 nice guy traits. So these nice guy traits, if they're desirable, they seem to be a little bit more stable over the lifetime, whereas younger women seem to express a stronger preference for a bad boy, you know? So maybe that's kind of a kind of settling down as time goes on or a maturation in that sense, whereas women get older, they become a little bit more mature. They don't value uh, some of these what are essentially youth behaviors more, right? Like higher athleticism, you know, men in their mid thirties on average, you know, they're not looking that great. They're not typically really high in athleticism and all of that, you know, confidence, adventurous, you know, men are settling down at that age. So you kind of see a congruence between female mate preferences and the way that male behavior changes with age. They're kind of settling down a little bit in that sense. But, you know, if it's eight out of 15, four out of 13, you tend to see that whatever traits are preferred uh, across, you know, at a young age, a lot of them still are preferred at an older age, some stability, but also some age differences. Let's go on now. Final thoughts here. What can we glean from all of this, these nice guy things? So I guess, you know, mentioned at the beginning, nice guy, bad boy, they mean a lot of different things. You know, don't assume that what you think of as this is what women think or what another guy is saying you know, or that it is the definition. What you're thinking of as a nice guy or a bad boy could be very, very different from what a woman says when she likes that. And, you know, if 
understanding dating and attractiveness, intersexual dynamics, and all of that is important to you, you have to develop kind of a good theory of mind, you know, particularly for the opposite sex. You have to come to learn to understand, you know, what women mean when they say something, not just what it means to you. What else? So you want kind of a synthesis, right, of the nice and the bad boy. You know, we looked at the past slide, past two slides, and it was a bunch of positive traits associated with nice guys and bad boys, things that are attractive to women. So, you know, you can have most of these at the same time, right? If athleticism is associated with a bad boy and intelligence is associated with a nice guy, you know, it's not impossible to be like athletic and intelligent, right? There's no contradiction there. You know, if risk taking is associated with, with a bad boy, you know, but like good planning is associated with a nice guy, you know, you can integrate those two things. So in that sense, you also kind of want an integration of the shadow, right? And what does that mean? Well, you probably need to have the capacity within you to be genuinely good, authentically good, right? Not just as an act, but also to be bad, authentically bad as well, right? To be capable of some destruction. And people will be able to tell if you're not, in a sense, right? I used to have a video up that was kind of like, I don't think you're going to be able to fake being an alpha. You know, you can't fake being an alpha. And what was the idea here? Well, you know, a lot of these personality traits, they require some real development and past life experience. We'll talk about that in, in a slide coming up in a second. But the point of these hard to fake signals is they're things that you're not going to easily be able to kind of copy or mimic. They're things that will show from the behaviors and the things that you have done in your life and kind of accomplished. Let's go on to the next slide. This integration of the nice guy and the bad boy. You know, this integration of the shadow. What does that mean? Women want someone who's kind to them, right? So kind to a mate. You should be kind to a mate. But you should have the potential to be aggressive toward outsiders, right? People who would threaten you, you know? You don't want to show the same kind of kindness to the whole world in that sense, which, you know, could be, in essence, a form of weakness as well. The bad boy, you know, he is attractive because he's able to attract many women. Why? In part, probably because of physical attractiveness, right? But also because of behavioral dominance, behavioral masculinity, and all of that. So, the bad boy is able to attract many women, but, and the nice guy, you know, he's not. But, at the same time, what do you want to be? You want to be able to attract many women, but committed to one, right? That's kind of what women are looking for, and you can see this as a theme in erotic literature, right? There's been studies on this, that this is a very pervasive theme, that a lot of the heroes in this, you know, they have an archetype of a bad boy. You know, he's a billionaire or a vampire or a werewolf or whatever. He's really wild. You know, he has a lot of women around him, some sexual experiences with him and all of that. But by the end of it, he's committed to the hero or the heroine of the story, right? He's committed to her. So that's it. You know, women don't want a man who's undesirable to all of the other women, but it's not an effect of, you know, like, well, I got to get a lot of women, so I'm desirable to more women. It's because he has those traits to begin with. They do want a man who is able to attract other women, but who is committed to them. Very important, okay? Risk-taking behavior, you know, we saw that, for example, in the willingness to approach women for a date. You know, not a huge risk, but for some, but still, it's terrifying, right, for a lot of men to approach a strange woman. So I say not a huge risk. Nothing's going to happen to you, you know, in most cases, but it's really hard to do. It's scary, you know, for most men to do it. So risk-taking behavior, you know, you jump off a cliff, you whatever, uh, whatever. Lots of risk-taking behavior, but that does not mean putting a mate in harm's way, right? Women might want a man who's able to take risks, who's not afraid, who's confident, who's bold and heroic, but at the same time, who's not going to hurt them, right? Who's not going to put them in risk because it's very different for you to take risks than it is for you to put your mate at risk, right? You taking risk signals, you know, from the evolutionary perspective, in part, a willingness to protect, a willingness to take risks on behalf of the other person in that relationship dyad, right? In that pair bond. But putting your mate at risk, you know, that's cost inflicting. That is not something that is sought. So again, you know, it's situational, it's contextual, it depends where the risk is directed. That's something that you kind of have to learn over time. Let's go on here to the next slide. Traits we see, right, associated kind of, you know, with, with the bad boy, but that are maybe ambiguous or good, right? So we've seen it. He's adventurous, he's brave, he's confident, all of that. But he's also not exciting, he's not boring. And the last one here, I said he's not a little pussy, okay? 
some people won't like that. They'll say it's misogynistic language or whatever. But I think that's actually something that, you know, goes through the minds of, of a lot of women. You know, they don't want a fucking wimp. What more can be said about that? You know, you can't just be a little pushover, right? And nothing about not being a pussy or not being a little wimp or whatever the case may be, you know, uh, doesn't make you a nice person or a kind person or a good person, right? Those are very different things. There's, there's no reason that the two can't exist, you know, within the same individual. Last slide, because I know people are going to ask, uh, how do you do it? How do you become more of a bad boy? And fewer people will ask, how do you become more of a nice guy? Why? Everyone thinks they're a good person. No one, you know, it's much easier, you know, to say, I don't have bad traits and I need to get more bad traits than it is to really look inside yourself and say, you know, I'm actually kind of, you know, not a good person. I have all of the nice guy traits that are weak and I don't have any of the virtuous nice guy traits, but, you know, that actually are attractive to women. But whatever the case may be, how do you do it? I don't know, man. This is not, you know, self-improvement advice channel. This is a psychology channel. So I don't have any big solutions from you. I will tell you, you know, that pickup artist number 2,437, you know, on Twitter or whatever with, you know, a picture of a statue for his profile picture is not going to give you the secrets in his PDF. But I will tell you some other things kind of related to that video I mentioned, you know, that I used to have that was, you know, I don't think you can fake being an alpha. Why? All of these personality traits are heritable. Okay, so there's a genetic component to them, which doesn't mean it's entirely genetic, you know, or fixed, that there's nothing you can do. But it is difficult to shift personality long term over time. When people do this, and there's been recent research on this that indicates, okay, personality can have large shifts when people have major life experiences. Okay, so that's another thing too. You know, if if you want to change your personality in big ways, you probably have to change your behavior and your life in big ways as well. You know, you want to be a bad boy or whatever. I guess you got to do, you know, bad boy things consistently. You have to live your life like that. There's no other, you know, way around it or you have to have had done it in the past at least, right? If you if you have no life history like that at all, you know, you can't expect to just start acting differently. It's not going to work, okay? But you can seek out, you know, uh, behaviors that might push you in that direction. You know, challenge your fears, okay? Things that you're afraid of, try to do those so that you're not afraid anymore. The more things that you do, you know, that you're afraid of, you'll stop being afraid of them. If that means approach women or jump off a cliff, whatever the case may be, you know, join the military, join a gang. I don't know. Don't do that. But examples, okay? You know, you have to uh, seek out risks in that sense. Take those risks and become, you know, kind of accepting of that so that it doesn't, you know, make your heart kind of leap into your neck every time you do something. Anyway, a little bit longer of a video. Hoped you liked it. We've gone over some research. Uh, Like, subscribe, hit the bell. I will make another video for you very soon.